Thank you very much, Shaleen, for those kind words. I've got a, a gift here for you, but it's not a gym shirt, but it's one of the Swalok, the Saldana Bay Water Quality Trust. I think with those, I think with those kind works words, um, we are fully open now. Thanks, Charlene. Um, the next speakers is Beverly and Mike um, Mall. Now, Beverly and Mike Mall, I phoned them yesterday, and um, just to get more information because they were they were quite sketchy when they they sent us their CVs. Uh, they reside in Feldruf next to the Burke River. And they are very active in conservation. Um, I've, I, by talking to them, I found that they are, they are looking at the bird life over there, looking off the avian population, as well as the Burke River estuary, which we know is very sensitive. And uh, Barry has also been doing research on that. They've been, for 16 years, they've been uh, honorary park rangers uh, of, the, of the sand parks um, in, in South Africa. So they, they support these parks all over the country, a uh, voluntary and uh, specifically the West Coast National Park. Um, so I would, I would like to call you to the front. Um, they have a multiple of awards also, and, um, and they, they're part of the Pelican Watch program. And that, I believe, is what you're going to tell us about. Thank you. Good morning. It's for us a privilege to be here to be able to share the work that our region and many other regions volunteers do in this area, particularly on the two islands, Jutten and Malchas. And the work that we are doing, that we're going to present this morning, is the Pelican Watch. I'm afraid you'll see us waving to ask for the next slide. There it is. And we're going to be covering, for those of us from our generation will remember the cowboy film, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Thank you. Next slide. So the Pelican Watch starts very early. The Pelican Watch's day starts at dawn because pelicans and seals and other problems don't wait for the middle of the day and for a decent nine o'clock starting time. They start early. Next slide, please. Okay, they seem to be. Right. Luckily, dawn is beautiful. In fact, the islands are beautiful all the time, but dawn is particularly beautiful because in the summer, which is when we're there, it's cool and it's nice and the birds start moving. So the dawn, the start of this presentation, we're going to go through a little bit about what is it like to be on the islands, life on the islands. What does the Pelican Watch actually do while on the islands and what is the impact of what we are doing. Next slide, please. So the Pelican Watch, as I've indicated, are on the two main islands for the breeding birds, on Malchas, guarding one entrance to the bay, and Jutten, guarding the other entrance to the bay. However, to get to the islands, we have to leave from the park offices, which are in Longabarn itself. So it's quite a trip to get out to the islands and you will see the problems with regard to that trip. But let's look at the two islands more closely. Next slide, please. Jutten, yeah, Jutten Island is the bigger of the two islands, which means that there's more work to be done on Jutten. But you'll also see that we use what you would probably call a child's map because it keeps changing. The places where the birds are keeps changing. And this is an indication of where the birds are to be found. So it tells us where we must go, where we must go look. Uh, fortunately for us, on Jutten, there are buildings in which we can stay. So it's not a question of taking your tent and camping outside. The building with the silver roof has got the, um, is where we are actually staying. That, that building there is where we stay during the Pelican Watch. Next slide, please. Malchas Island is much smaller than Jutten, but it has a much greater population of seabirds. Again, we have a map that we keep up to date, drawing and 
pasting with post-it notes as the season progresses, indicating where the breeding colonies are so that we don't disturb the breeding birds. Again, as with Jutton, we have a place that we can stay. That square building over there has quarters available for pelican watchers to stay in. So it may be dawn, it may be just birds, but you're up, you're at it, you're walking. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm afraid we do not have that on the island. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> we seem to have lost our slides. <laughs> right, the Pelican Watch. The Pelican Watch. Sun Park's Honorary Rangers, West Coast region. We organize the Pelican Watch every year in the summer months from November through to mid-February, almost four months of the year. And this project, let's put it this way, has been ongoing since 2005. Next slide, please. In uh, 1956, and this is why the Pelican Watch started, the great white pelican breeding on Dussan the, their numbers increased dramatically from 500 breeding pairs to 2,000 breeding pairs due to the fact that farmers in the stellenbosch Justenberg area were th um, chucking out offal from piggeries and day-old chicks and the pelicans learned that this was a good easy takeaway. And in 2005, the Department of Agriculture stopped this practice of dumping food in the felt and the pelicans were suddenly starving, but now they're 2,000 breeding pairs, and their breeding time coincides with the same breeding period of the gannets and the cormorants on islands, on Malchas and Jutten Island, but on all the islands. So the pelicans used their learnt behavior and came up from Dawson Island to forage on the chicks on these islands. Um, a researcher working on Malchas Island at the time it's Marta da Ponte Machado. She started uh, researching, doing her doctorate, and she divided the island up into two zones, a pelican-free zone and a pelican-friendly um, zone. So the pelicans were allowed to occupy one half of the island, and the other part was pelicans were being chased. And this became the start of Pelican Watch. Next slide, please. So what are we protecting? The gannets on Molchas Island. Why the gannets? This is the second largest breeding colony and it is two and a half times larger than the gannet colony at Lambert's Bay. Next slide, please. The endangered Cape Cormorant. The gannets are also endangered. That's a technical term. The endangered Cape Cormorant it's a fairly large breeding uh, population on Jutten Island. They also breed on Malchas, but um, we are also looking after the Cape Cormorant on Jutten. Next slide, please. On these islands, you will find packed stone walls. And on the southern side of both islands, uh, these walls are quite a lot taller or higher. And in the 1840s, when the, when the Great Guano Rush started on the west, southwest western coast of southern Africa, these walls were made so that the bags of guano, and guano is known as white gold, otherwise a natural fertilizer, these bags would be stored behind the walls until they could be taken off the island. And although the Great Guano Rush was over by the 1850s, Guano scraping and bird collecting and egg collecting continued right up into the 1970s on these islands and other islands. Next slide, please. There's a lot of history. Man's effect on these islands goes back as far as the 1590s, or in fact when the Portuguese started coming around the Cape. Um, there have been many shipwrecks on these islands and around the coast, just to indicate this, uh, a fam the famous shipwreck 
the Mira Stone was shipwrecked off the southwestern point of Jutton in 1702. It was carrying cargo of silver um, coins, mainly silver coins, for trade in the east and also to pay the troops at the Cape. And when this boat sank, uh, of course everything went to the bottom. And it is thought to be proved, I suppose, that the cannon that is on the island is from the Mira stain. And every now and then, a coin pops up in a penguin nest. <laughs> and also on these islands, people were living on the islands. These islands have been used for burial. People have been buried there. Some graves, like these two, with inscriptions. And at the back there, um, that is where the, uh, the Miristain uh, people that drowned when the Miristain sank, that's where they are buried. And the last photo is a photo of guano scraping. This was taken... Okay. This was taken in the 1950s, and um, they were guano scraping. And it was an article that was written for the farming magazine. Next slide. So having done your early morning round, you're now ready to go and have breakfast. But it's very important to know where you're going to have breakfast. That... That is a photo of the living quarters that were used in the past years, but they're not in use at the moment. We must remember that there were many more people living on the islands, the laborers, etc., and so they had to build accommodation with many bunks and tables, and they built kitchens on these islands, all in disuse. This instead is where we do stay. These, this is the accommodation on Jutton Island, and it is, first of all, the manager's house, which we are busy trying to restore because it requires a lot of painting, scraping, beetle treatment, and other things to get it going. And the other house, known as the Long House, which was, in fact, the storeroom for food originally, which has been converted into accommodation with a kitchen for use by the Pelican Watchers. Next slide, please. Malchas Island. The middle slide shows a front view of the manager's house, which is where we stay, if you remember that square roof. And the other slide to the right shows the manager's house. And then the small building, which are known as the research quarters. Notice on Jutton we talked about longhouse. On Malchas we talk about research quarters because there are many researchers that come out to do their work. We've already mentioned Marta de Ponte Machado. But at the moment, for example, there are two researchers from Nelson Mandela University on Malchas. Next slide, please. The main elements when you are staying on any place are obviously water, number one. And how do we get water? Well, there's two kinds of water. There's water you can drink and water you don't want to drink. Um, the water you can drink we bring with us, 25 liter containers get shipped out and you'll see just now amongst the challenges, what that entails. On the islands, though, there are tanks, a big Jojo tank on Jutton, and then there are cisterns, like in the middle slide, where the middle picture, where there are old, very old catchments from the roofs that go into these cisterns. We do treat this water, and we use it for washing and cleaning. However, the cistern on Jutton, unfortunately, has cracked, and so we need to be able to get into the cistern empty it and reseal it, which is quite a process. And unfortunately, if you're as large as I am, you don't fit inside anyway. Um, maybe I should go to that gym. <laughs> Gas is used for fridges, and you can see the kind of fridge that we use there. These have been bought out of funds by the SHRs and donated to the islands. And also for stoves, again, these have been bought by SHR funds and donated to the islands for use. On the stove, you will see gray kettles for gray water, red kettles for coffee water. Don't confuse the two. Next slide, please. There is solar power. The solar power there is mainly used for lights in some of the sleeping quarters, and you can charge your cell phones, and you can charge batteries, and you can even run your laptop during the day. 
not recommended to run these things at night because you will use up all the solar power. We have also we are busy experimenting with putting up portable solar lights and on Malchas in particular, it led to great joy when we could actually provide a light in the toilet. Next slide, please. Communication, as you may have gathered from saying you can charge your cell phones, is actually very good. Thanks to the South African Defence Force, there's very good cell phone reception on both islands, as we are adjacent to Defence Force areas on both sides. Um, just to give you an idea, I'm busy holding a meeting with someone up in Johannesburg, sitting on a rock, much to their disgust. Um, and talking about disgust, one of the other things is the toilet facilities. We still have not managed to get past the bucket system. Um, it is a bit of a problem on the islands, but on the other hand, we do it every day, keep it clean, keep it going, and it puts off those people that want to go to a spa experience. Next slide, please. Logistics, logistics are hard. On the logistics on the island are hard and can be very challenging. Next slide, please. After consultation with the West Coast National Park, the call gets put out by us, Pelican Watch team, to the, uh, all the regions, all the Sandfox Honorary Ranger regions in South Africa. And uh, this happens towards the end of May. And then the SHRs in the Sandparks regions, they, are, they can apply and they put a team together to come and do Pelican Watch duty starting in November. There are 2,000 SHRs throughout the country in 31 regions, and they come from as far north as Limpopo and right down to the southern tip of Africa. These stars that you are seeing represent the regions that are of the, the people that are coming down to Pelican Watch this season. We have 75 Sandpox Honorary Rangers who have put teams together for this season. As I said, from as far north as Limpopo, right down to the southern tip of Africa. Next slide, please. So what do you have to do? You have to pack very, very concisely. You have to make sure that you take your pillow, your sleeping bag, and your towel, minimal clothes and enough provisions for seven days plus an extra ration in case the weather turns bad and the boat cannot fetch you. If you don't want to get wet, you put on a rain suit, um, as you can see, while traveling over to the island. Everything has to travel by boat. The water, the 20 liters of water per person has to go across, plus the gas, plus your luggage, and the boat is small, as you can see, and here the boat at the bottom is taking out the fridge, which we purchased last year for Pelican Watch, and you can see how low it is in the water. And then lastly, everybody's always kitted up in life jackets, and the boat is about to depart for the overseas trip to the islands. Next slide, please. The old jetty, as you can see, has weathered many a winter storm. Um, in the middle, you, the boat is approaching the ladder, which has been lowered for disembarkment. And on the right, you can see the, the uh, boat in the background and someone climbing up the ladder being assisted by one of the marine crew. Next slide, please. Jetties on Molchas, as you can see, the jetty on Molchas is actually much longer. And once the ladder has been lowered and everybody's on the island, once the boat when the boat leaves, um, somebody on the island has to pull up the ladder. So the ladder is never left floating in the sea, that it will cause damage. And also, we just don't want people pitching up on the island without any permission. The weather can be rough. Spring tides, heavy swells, winds, as you can see in the far right. And then you also see the Malchas jetty on the left with very calm seas. Next slide, please.
So although we've talked about dawn, we've talked about living on the island, but what are we actually doing there? I think we can summarize it as follows. We are patrolling for problems. And what are these problems? Next slide, please. Well, before we get to the problems, how do we patrol? And we have to stick to the paths of righteousness, which basically means we don't go any place anywhere we make certain that we stick to the areas which will not disturb the breeding birds. On Malchas we have the advantage that there is an actually demarcated path, gannets being fairly placid and fairly predictable, but on Jutten we don't really have that luxury because the cormorants change their breeding spots from year to year. So there are no standard paths on Jutten. Each year they have, people have to work out where they are going to walk and that is why we had that hand-drawn map. What we do have on both islands are lookouts. Malchas Island is nine meters above sea level. It used to be 19, but 10 meters got taken away with a guano. So it's only nine meters, so we had to build an artificial lookout. And there you can see the lookout on top of the little building. That is on Malchas. Jutten, on the other hand, has got two natural features, two hills, known by the very complicated names of Big Hill, and Little Hill. And this is the view from Big Hill overlooking Little Hill towards Malchas. So we post an observer on top of Big Hill to do a lookout because that observer has to tell us where, what, where the problems are. And the problems are basically our public enemies. Public enemy number one and public enemy number two. You, we can argue about the order. Public enemy number one, the seal. Now, there are seals on, on seal rock next to Jutton, which we don't mind because seals are a natural feature of the area. But when the seals start coming ashore, such as the naughty boy in the middle picture that came onto Malchas, and this was taken last month, so it's a very recent picture, they can be problematic and have to be dealt with. And then the pelicans, who have given their name to the pelican watch, coming ashore onto the island. These are the two main problems, but they're not the only ones. We also have the kelp gulls. Now, kelp gulls are notorious scavengers. Here you can see a kelp gull actually chewing on an egg. And if you're wondering about that particular egg, that egg is a kelp gull egg that a kelp gull has predated. They are cannibals, kelp gulls. Cannibalism we don't mind too much because uh, that reduces their numbers, but they are also, unfortunately, very fond of gannet eggs. There's a collection of gannet eggs that a breeding kelp gull has collected over a few days. Goes and helps himself to an egg for breakfast. But he also helps himself to chicks. And the kelp gull will turn a chick inside out and predate it completely. These two are examples of seal predation. The first one is a gannet that has been bitten by a seal but has made it ashore. Unfortunately, these gannets seldom survive. The other picture shows what is left after a seal has taken a bird in the water. The seal grabs the bird hits the bird on the water to break the wings off and then predates the bird. It's part of the bird and the rest just washes ashore. So you can see the broken wings of the bird. Seal predation is recorded, but we don't do anything about the seals predating in the water, but when they come on land, we have a problem. Next slide, please. If you want to know how pelicans predate, just compare the two pouches. The rear bird has got nothing. The front bird actually has a chick in its pouch. And he's flying off the island with a whole chick in the pouch. And that is the problem with the pelicans. They don't predate eggs, they predate the living chicks. Okay. So, Part of patrolling requires you to be suitably attired. It may be summer, but a jacket is not a bad idea 
A hat is absolutely necessary and you need the stick. The stick is not because we're all old. The stick is, if you see the middle picture, because the kelp gulls attack you quite viciously. They have, in fact, knocked people out on the island. Why do you have the jacket and the hat? The kelp gulls don't always knock you out. They use other means of disposing of you. Um, old jackets, not new ones. Next slide, please. Part of the other problems that we have are, of course, avian flu. You all remember a couple of years back the big outbreak of avian flu, 12,000 birds on Dyer Island. Well, we lost about 2,000 birds on Jutton. And that required, the protocol is very clear, required the car uh, carcasses to be collected and to be burnt. The good news is that once the carcasses were burnt and disposed of and the island was cleaned, the cormorant actually did return and breed. Yes, the breeding was late, but they could actually return and breed. So avian flu is a problem, and we really keep tabs on what's happening with any illness. For example, next slide. This is a swift turn that is in trouble. So birds like this that are ill, that are showing symptoms that we're not sure of, what we usually do is take them off the island, either living or even if they have deceased and we're not sure about it, and we send them to Sandcob for verification of what the problem is. It's not always avian flu. Two years ago, we lost a huge number of Egyptian geese to botulism. So that can also occur on the island. And it's one of the problems that we have to keep an, out, an eye out for. Next slide, please. We've talked about the kelp gull. Just a little bit more, a uh, little bit more detail about the kelp gull. On the bottom, at the top right, that is a teenage kelp gull sitting next to his parent, mother or father. And at the bottom, you will see a kelp gull chick next to two unhatched siblings. In the middle uh, bottom, uh, just a comparison between the size of a gannet and a kelp gull. A kelp gull is actually quite a big bird. And then some of the kelp gulls, about one in 20, show this pink coloration. And uh, we can debate this, but um, we think it's a genetic predisposition. Uh, when, when the kelp gulls eat the kreef at low tide on the islands, um, they can turn pink. Next slide, please. And the gannets. The gannets uh, take off. They've got a runway on Molchas Island. They take off and off they go to sea. Their diving speeds when they're hunting for food can vary between 40 and 120 kilometers, depending on how high they are diving from. And on the right, the stone-packed walls on Jutton Island Cape Cormorant, they like to sit there, and in fact, if they feel comfortable, they will also nest on these walls, which are on the island. Next slide, please. The crowned cormorant, crowned because it has a little crown on top of its head with its red eye, with chicks. Crowned cormorants and bank cormorants on the right are endangered. The crowned cormorant, has a near threatened status in South Africa because of its small distribution range. And the bank cormorant is actually in a very bad way, severe straits, dire straits. There are very few bank cormorant on the island. Next slide, please. Penguins. There used to be large penguin colonies on these islands. Today, there are very few penguin uh, there's a very small population of penguins on the islands. They are breeding. In the middle, you can see a penguin in molt. And on the right, uh, on the right you'll see the, the African oyster catcher. But on the left, the, the penguin, this penguin is thinking about going to sea. And he is trying to negotiate the slippery rock. The, on the right, the African oyster catcher plays a very vital role in reducing and controlling the Mediterranean mussel 
in Saldana Bay and Longaban Lagoon. And it was previously listed as, in the 1980s, it was listed as near threatened, but it's now gained, its population gain has been about 33%, and it is almost out of the danger zone. So the African oyster catcher is doing very well. Next slide, please. And then in the winter, the Antarctic terns come up from the south, from the Southern Ocean, to visit these islands. And there's a large roost on Malchas Island. We found about 2,000 tern. And if you think there aren't any other terns in the middle, you will see a little Caspian tern chick, which was breeding on Jutton Island last year. Next slide, please. And then, lastly, he doesn't have feathers. <laughs> he has fur. With the expansion of uh, the VOC, the Dutch East, East, East Indies Company, in the 1600s, rabbits were placed on all the islands as they traveled going to the east as a food source for passing ships. And these rabbits gradually died out. But in the 1950s, for food, as a food source, rabbits were reintroduced to these islands and other islands and then became feral. There are, there's a small population of rabbits on Jutten, nothing on Molchas anymore. Next slide, please. So obviously if we've been busy doing something for nearly 20 years, we'd like to know that what we are doing is achieving success. Next slide, please. So we do a lot of data collection on the islands, and this data is then shared with Sand Parks and with other um, interested people, particularly the Cape Research Center of Sand Parks. But the data is not just collected on the forms by every single Pelican Watch. Next slide, please. It is also collated and presented um, in graphical form so that we can understand what's going on. This is what's being eaten by the seals off Jutton Island, for example as expected, 75% Cape Cormorant, but 25% other birds. Next slide. And then we also make a note of all the dead birds and seals found on the different islands. This one is on Malchas, and it tells us where to look on the islands for the dead birds. And what we try and do then is try and relate why are they dying, what has been the cause of that. The main success, obviously, is to do with the breeding success. And having seen all the breeding chicks, that is really what tells us that we are being successful. Cape Cormorant is now no longer as endangered and as threatened as it was it because there is a greater breeding success taking place. And similarly, next slide, the, gannets, the gannet colonies on Malchas, having had a disastrous collapse due to food sources, are actually showing signs of some resuscitation. And this year's season, we're pleased to announce, has got an additional number of breeding gannets. The area which the colony is, is, is covering has uh, expanded since last year already. So that shows that by protecting the breeding, we are bringing in more breeders. In other words, the chicks are breeding more successfully. Next slide, please. So what is the future of the watch? Going forward, uh, Pelican Watch will be, will be needed. And we need, this is what we need, continued support from the SHR organization and the SHR regions. They really support us, not only with volunteers, but also purchasing much needed equipment and paying for maintenance of specific parts on the island. Next slide. The park works very hard to get us on and off the island, and also with certain maintenance on the island, but they're handicapped with the lack of funds. The boat in the middle, the boat in the middle of the water, is called Pelicanus. It was especially built for trips to the islands to support the islands, and it's currently out of commission because it needs new engines, and that is why we use the small rubber duck borrowed from Table Mountain National Park. Next slide. The buildings on the islands, the fittings, furnishings, 
or supported financially by the SHRs and also physically by SHRs by doing the work. We thank every member of the SHRs and the public for their continued support and fundraising efforts in kind and in monetary form. And then, as Captain Gannett will say, we actually all need to work together to make this one of the flagship projects of conservation in our area to be stronger together. Next slide. So at the end of the day, how can we summarize the Pelican Watch? First of all, at the end of the day, you do get to relax. At the end of every day, the volunteers work hard. They work for the whole day. Not only are they patrolling for the problems, but as you've seen, we actually also do a lot of maintenance on the islands. Um, at present, they are busy painting again. They always paint. Next day. And we have the most magnificent sunsets. We have the most magnificent moonrises. There's a feeling of satisfaction amongst everybody. Because at the end of the day, this project is about impact. This project is about making sure that the sun will not set on these two breeding colonies. And it is the support of everybody, as Beverly has just explained, that helps us make certain that this project goes ahead and keeps these birds safe. Thank you. Thank you.